Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson. I'm here with Greg Uttinger. And we're taking a little bit of a, uh, a different topic today. We've just finished up sort of a series of very theological topics, and now we're going to talk about cave people. Uh, but before we do that, I think we should introduce ourselves again. It's episode eight now, so it's been a while. Um, so, Greg, who are you? Why do you know about cave people? Why do you know about all of these things that we've been talking about? And also, if I could ask, your favorite movie, you are allowed up to five arbitrarily. All right. I'm Greg Ottinger. I'm a high school teacher. I've been a high school teacher since 1981. I've generally had small classes and I've worked in small Christian schools, which means I've got to teach a little bit of everything from Latin to drama, from chemistry and physics to theology. And I've, over the years, I've taught four theology classes in particular, systematics, prolegomena, ethics, and biblical theology. And I've taught them to teenagers pretty successfully. I've also taught world history and world lit, American lit, English lit, and all kinds of other things. So I, I don't think that makes me an expert on everything except maybe how to make things up as you go along, which is a hint <laughs> to one of my favorite movies. Uh, when you're working for a small Christian school, you don't have a lot of time to prepare. And so you learn everything you can, when you can, and then you try to throw it all together whenever you can, because you never know what how much time you're going to have or what's going to happen next or who's going to need what. So there's background. I've written, ghostwritten, a lot of articles on theology and Christian worldview. I've written a number under my own name, and you can probably find them on the Faith for All of Life website. It used to be the Chalcedon website. So you can go looking there. I'm so glad you just said that out loud because I've been having an ongoing disagreement about how to pronounce that word. Some well, people it, say Chalcedon. <laughs> It depends who you are, and there are people who will die over the pronunciation, but that's the one I grew up with, and that's the one I use. I, I'm not offended with people who use some other some other name, <laughs> some other pronunciation. Uh, as we talk about K people, pronunciation may be an issue tonight, and my girls, I have three girls, two teenagers and one 20-something, were mocking my pronunciation of a number of words, and they're waiting for me to say that word that describes large <laughs> reptilian monsters. And I said, I'm not going to say it because you mock me when I say it. That gives you more background about me than you really probably need. Uh, as for my favorite movies, yeah, we have to put Raiders of the Lost Ark up there, but we must also include Casablanca, Charade, certainly. I haven't uh, seen that one. Yeah, what? You got out of my class and you never saw Charade? <laughs> David, take her to uh, rent Charade. Show it to her. It's important. Uh, and the other two can remain a mystery for now. So that's who I am. Who are you? Who am I? Um, well, I have a degree in history from Hillsdale College, um, which means I've studied a lot of things and I've learned <laughs> how to study somewhat. <laughs> I've learned how not to organize my time. After college, I learned how to organize my time. I live in the DC area with my husband, who's a computer science researcher, and I've done a little bit of work in education policy. And now I do this. This is kind of my, my hobby. This is my excuse to research loads of things and just learn how to teach myself. Emily and David are the inspiration for this podcast. Uh, we used to record my high school lectures, and then you can still find them up on the internet someplace in bits and pieces. But they thought it would be fun to do this all over again. And if we reach 100 people or 1,000 people, as God wills, great. In the meantime, we're having fun. So mm -hmm. listen along and yeah. see if you have fun too. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't gotten to tell you my five favorite movies yet. Oh, yes. I agonized over this list. All right. Let's hear them. Sound of Music, The Great okay. Escape. Yes. Um, I forget what the third one was. <laughs> It'll come back to me. The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, the Ben Stiller version, not There's the Danny Kaye. There's a Ben Kay. Stiller. What? There's oh, a Ben yes. Stiller version? Oh, my word. So the, I, I watched the Danny Kaye one growing up. Yeah. And then after we got married, David was like, I haven't seen the old one, but I've seen the new one. And I was like, well, it's a remake. And at, at that time, I didn't believe in remakes. Yes, I they was don't like, exist. you know, it's Danny Kaye. Like, why would you replace Danny Kaye? Right. But I watched it the Ben Stiller version, and it is an entirely different film, and it's so artistic and well done. It is 
easily in my top five. It's mm, it's really great. I'll have to watch it then. Yeah. And then after you watch it, you can't go back and expect the old one to be of course not. the new one. Like mm. it's it's very different. Yeah. And then oh man, what was number three? Oh, shop around the corner. My wife's favorite or one of her favorites. It's to so be sure. good. Yeah. It's so well put together. It's my father's favorite also. And then lastly, possibly because it is the most recent, I just saw 1917 and that blew me away. My girls just saw it and they are raving about it and insisting I have to see it on the big screen. So I guess I get to take yeah. Kate there before too long. Yeah. All right. Do now people recommend. know all they need to know. Actually, it was on the basis of a conversation like this that I got interested in my wife because I asked her her favorite books and her favorite movies. And when they turned out to be mine, things began <laughs> to happen. So be careful who you tell your favorite movies to. Oh, wow. Oh, wait, you're married. It's fine. Yeah. All right. Cave people. Why, why are we talking about cave people? Why is this important, Greg? There is a method to all of this madness, and eventually we'll tell you what it is. But right now, it's the next thing on the list. Our intent is not so much to address Christians who are steeped in theology as it is Christians who are maybe searching for a little more depth to their theology, but live in the secular world what a good friend of mine calls uh, Fox Republicans. They, they have good instincts politically, economically, but they don't always know what the theological roots or basis ought to be. They haven't thought through or haven't been taught. And sooner or later, we come to the issue of, of uh, Darwinianism, of macroevolution. And cave people are a popular way that this thing shows up. When you start talking about Darwinianism, you're talking about a chain of being from a molecule to man that goes through many steps, but by far the most colorful, the most entertaining, and the one that inspired the Flintstones is that <laughs> of cave people. When Darwin first put forward his theory, he had some vague ideas of how this thing might work. They were all wrong, and everyone knows they're wrong, but it involved some kind of biological succession as each species evolved into a new species and somehow looking at apes and men, there seemed to be some kind of either lineal descent or common ancestor, doesn't matter what you want to call it. They look alike, therefore. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and Darwin had no evidence, but his theory caught on like wildfire. And scientists, being scientists, sort of, thought that maybe some evidence would be good. They'd already bought the theory. Uh, <laughs> the Darwin was not persecuted. He was not rejected. His book sold out the first edition, went through other printings. Uh, Europe and America were ripe for this when it came. The fact that it absolutely lacked any kind of evidence did not seem to bo bother anybody because everybody was sure, since it, this was obviously true, the alternative being unacceptable now, uh, that the evidence would come. And what appealed to the imagination of that time, and probably of every time, is our immediate ancestors. Before man, then what? Ape man, cave man, uh, scientists can, can balk at the popular terms, but that's what people call them. And as Christians, we should probably stop and say, well, what about this? Our, what, what does Genesis say? What does the Bible say? Our goal here is not to go into a prolonged scientific discussion. I don't have a degree in biology. It can go about as far as physics and math. But there's some obvious things we can say. And I, I think up front, I would like to recommend to everybody G.K. Chesterton's book, The Everlasting Man, mm -hmm. and particularly the, the chapter, The Man in the Cave. And a lot of what, it, or at least what I'm going to talk about, is going to be based on that very simple idea that flows around the idea of cave paintings. The man in the cave, the caveman, and so far as we know much about him, was a painter. He was an artist. He was creative, mm -hmm. which is to say, whatever else he was, he was a man. And I've got a great clip from that that I'll read later if I can get to it. So mm -hmm. that's that's why this. Now, the, the more positive side, and maybe we'll get there before we're done. You know, we'll probably get there next time if we don't, is, well, what is man? If man is not a creature who evolved from other life forms, I don't know if lower is even acceptable anymore, that may be speciesism, hmm. <laughs> then what is he? And of course, the biblical answer is he's the image of God. And we need we do need to talk about that more directly at some point. Uh, so in a sense, how did we get here? Well, we moved out of Genesis 1-1 down to Genesis 1-28 is how we got <laughs> here. 
<laughs> it's it's the next theological step, but it's also, I think, in terms of um, addressing about our culture, it's something we have to at least wave our hand at and say, here's some things to think about. So I was, as I was doing a little bit of research on the topic, uh, just sort of preliminary, little past Wikipedia levels, I was so struck by how evidence can look so vastly different depending on where you start. Mm. And that the expert opinions, experts are people too, <laughs> and they start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you can follow their logic if they present it. But I find it very easy personally, and I think this is really prevalent in the culture today, that we hear an expert opinion and we think that's that's the expert, that's it. I don't, I can't follow, I don't have a degree in that, you know, I haven't written a book, they clearly know what they're talking about, and they are authorized to speak on this, and I am not. But really, once you get into something, if they can teach you about it, then they really know something. Mm-hmm. But if they're just handing down assertions without telling you how they got there, that's kind of insulting <laughs> if you think about it. Like, you know, we have minds and they work and people get to be experts by learning um, and you don't have to be an expert to know something. Mm -hmm. We as Christians appeal to the Bible as God's inspired infallible word. And people will say, well, that's blind faith. It's not blind, but it is faith. And we can talk about that some other time. We, we've kind of been talking about it all along. It's some of the proofs in the long-range putting of all of our discussions. But we acknowledge, yeah, this is faith. We start on the Word of God because God, being the only one there when the world was created and being himself the creator, certainly knows what he did. He knows what happened. Now, that sounds like sheer superstition to the average secular scientist. It would be easy to say with, with the, the image that science has built for itself, or rather the image of science, capital mm -hmm. S, italics, <laughs> underlined, bold, that scientists have built for themselves. They present themselves as people who are rational, logical, and who have truckloads of evidence, which they have carefully put together in the only possible way it could be put. And they may allow for a few minor family disagreements, although barely. Uh, Thomas Kuhn's book on the structure of scientific revolutions comes to mind here. But they, they think that they have a rational framework. And because they think this, it's true for them. They, they absolutely believe that that's the case. And having that firm foundation, that confidence, that faith, mm -hmm. they speak out of that faith without bothering to go back now and then and check and see if they have, by their own standards, the kind of evidence they would require of us. How much of what they tell us is them simply speaking out of a doctrine, Darwinian evolution, that they've accepted by faith, and then having accepted that, they find that, oddly enough, all the evidence points to it, because that's the way we work as human beings. Once we are committed something, we automatically can't see the evidence any other way. And it takes generally either some profound emotional experience or some huge event within our culture or the operation of the Spirit of God in our hearts to break through that and say, you know, there's another way of looking at this. And where there is so much pressure in the scientific establishment to conform, it is very hard for anyone even to consider questioning what they've got. And it doesn't have to be a questioning in, in, in the direction of biblical faith, just to say, you know what, I, I, I'm no Christian, I don't believe the Bible, but our evidence stinks. Our, <laughs> our, our rational connections aren't rational and they're not connected. We need, a, we need a better theory, guys. The problem, of course, is there isn't one. We've seen a little bit of... Uh, reaching out to, well, maybe alien intrusion. That was a big thing <laughs> 20 years I ago or so. I that one, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that didn't go very far. There, I'm sure there are still some people who believe in that because people were getting nervous. Whereas the evidence should be overwhelming. We shouldn't be having to scrounge all over the place to find a, one or two missing links. There should be abundant, plural, missing links not just A and E, but A, B, C, D, E, and then F, G, H after that. And we're not finding them. And every time we find 
when we make some kind of fossil find, it generally invalidates a number of other fossil finds that we were pretty sure about. Mm -hmm. Neanderthal man went from being obviously the heavy-browed caveman who cannot speak and maybe wears skins and maybe carries a club, and that's about it, to now the establishment admits he's just one other form or branch or subspecies of humanity. He's, he's human. Mm -hmm. He buried his dead. He sprinkled the dead with flowers. He uh, worked with tools. He did things that humans do. And, and yet each time that secular science itself invalidates its own past and its own past assumptions, those, it only invalidates so far back. It doesn't, it never goes to the foundation and never says, wait a minute. Maybe Darwin was simply wrong. Maybe there is some other explanation someplace. Or if we can't find one, why don't we just say we don't know? <laughs> and, and we can go ahead and keep saying Christianity is superstition, but let's admit that we don't have an alternative. That's not acceptable. No one's going to do that because there's far too much commitment and there's a genuine fear that if they ever say we don't know and we have no evidence and we can't, or the evidence does not say what we've been telling you, it says that they're going to lose credibility, they're going to lose their place in the scientific guild, they're going to lose their funding. The whole thing's going to fall apart. Now, they may or may not consciously have processed this. We often don't. We often, we, we often do not say, I am now falling victim to peer pressure. <laughs> but that's what it amounts to in many respects. So we, we went to look a little bit at caves and cave paintings and things like that. And we want to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says about cavemen, because you know what? There are cavemen in the Bible. Ooh. Yay. Yay. The Bible knows about cavemen. It, it has a lot to say about them. But first, let's, let's, I believe you did some research on cave paintings. <laughs> yeah, well, I did a little bit on one, uh, one location where cave paintings were found. That is La Marche in France. And they're really great paintings, like not great paintings like Van Gogh. But like, if you look at them, okay, if you picture cave paintings in your mind and then go and look at what these cave paintings were like, they're not at all, like, they're a whole nother level. They're like cartoons. They're like, I think you compared them in an earlier conversation or something to the New Yorker. Like yeah. they're, they're caricatures, like on that level, they've got distinct people being portrayed and they're wearing clothes, they're wearing hats, they're it's just very they're sophisticated. They're boots, they're carrying tools. Yeah. yeah it's, they're, they're not at all like what cave people should be dressed like. It's almost as somebody from prehistoric times, time traveled to New York City, looked around in, say, the 1960s or 70s, took Polaroids and went back and then <laughs> copied them in cartoon style. Maybe took the New Yorker in hand <laughs> said, huh, let's, let's, let's draw them like this. Yeah. Now, for a long time, these paintings were simply ignored and suppressed because that's not what cave people do. They can't. And it's, and it's uh, only been with time and several revisions that, that now the establishments, if Wikipedia counts as, an, as part of the establishment. <laughs> well, Wikipedia cites several sources that are generally mm. considered to be establishments. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the swing seems to be back to say... Maybe cave people didn't dress the way we thought they did. Mm -hmm. once, once you're very secure, it's okay to acknowledge the, the attempted attacks of your opponents in the past. Once you're sure that their attacks mean nothing, you can come back and say, well, yes, okay, that was a good point. It doesn't mean what you thought it means, but we now acknowledge the point at least. <laughs> but back in the 30s, 40s, 50s and earlier... Nobody would admit that cavemen did anything other than dress in skins. They could barely speak. They carried clubs around. They did not understand Mary. I mean, the, the Hulk pop culture thing of the of the big brute who smashes his uh, would be wife on the head, I mate, not not wife, and then drags her off by the hair. That's what's stuck in the public consciousness, and it's it owes a lot to scientists and museum scientist who worked with what little information we had and from a few bones created not only full-blown skeletons, but facial hair, haircuts, <laughs> clothing styles. So crowds would throng to museums and see cavemen as the museum scientist had decked them out. 
without the slightest bit of real evidence. And along comes this, this find of cave paintings, cave drawings more accurately. And it's, you, you look at the two and there's no, there's no coherence here. There's, there's, the same people cannot have, the, the people we see in the museum with the heavy brows and the clubs and the leopard skins, they cannot possibly be the people who drew these cartoons. So the cartoons were were shoved as this is obviously a forgery or hoax or something. And this was like the French uh, Archaeological Society. Yeah, I forget what the name of the organization is, but this this was the professionals who were like, no, no, cavemen don't do that. I don't know what you found, right. but it wasn't cavemen. And, <laughs> so it, and that's what we yeah. keep getting. We we mm-hmm. already know the truth. Therefore, your evidence does not exist. I don't have to look at your evidence. I already know up front it does not exist. Mm-hmm. This is argument in a circle. Christians are accused of this. And if understood correctly, we will confess. Yes, we believe in the Bible because it's the word of God. And we know it's the word of God because God wrote it. And we come to it by faith. Now, there's more to that. But just leaving it at that, how is that significantly different from, I believe in Darwinian evolution. Uh, this piece of evidence contradicts that. Therefore, this piece of evidence could not possibly exist, nor do I have to look to see what it might be, or if it in any way threatens me and threatens my position or undermines it, I already know it doesn't exist. I don't care what you say you have or say you saw or what you've measured or anything. It's either a hoax, a lie, or radical misinterpretation and obviously not even worth my investigation it's because I already know what happened. Although apparently I don't have any evidence for it. And yet they will go on and talk about how overwhelming the evidence is for Darwinian evolution and will continually insist that it's scientific fact. Everybody knows this. Uh, there's, There's nothing left to debate. And if you say that enough times, high school and college kids will believe you. And people who watch National Geographic and Nova Specials will believe you. (laughs) And people who watch Planet Earth or Blue Planet or anything that David Attenborough narrates will (laughs) simply take it as fact because, well, it's on TV. They wouldn't be there if it weren't true. And everybody knows it and everyone I talk to knows it. So who are these Christians and what weird rock did they crawl out from under? (laughs) Forgetting that for the bulk of Earth's history, people have believed in a creator and that man is not an animal. Yeah. <laughs> Another fun thing about the Lamarche discoveries was all the stuff they found on the floor of the cave. Mm-hmm. There was, again, some really sophisticated stuff, including little pits mm-hmm. that pictured constellations, especially right. the Pleiades. Pleiades yeah. um, and it's posited that perhaps they filled them with animal fat to burn as candles, to be like the night sky underneath them and then they realized after they discovered that this was the march that like this is potentially what's been on the floor of every cave we've ever looked at except (laughs) we immediately walked in and destroyed it so that we could measure everything yeah Yeah, we forgot we forgot to look down it's like the uh, in role playing the, the advice is always look up when you come into a new chamber here it's look down before you mutilate what's on the ground So, for instance, in Altamira, we have uh, multicolored images of, oh, bison and horses and boars and a hind. And the artists have made use of the contours of the cave to produce the three-dimensional image. When these first came out, these were denounced as fraud because, again, cavemen couldn't do this. But eventually, when these things began showing up in caves all over Europe, all over France particularly, Finally, scientist bows said, all right, fine. Okay, so cavemen were artistic, I guess. <laughs> and then the ones we've been talking about showed up. They said, but not those. That's too artistic. That's too modern. It's almost postmodern. Okay, fine. They can draw, but they can't draw well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I mentioned earlier G.K. Chesterton's book, The Everlasting Man and the, the uh, chapter, The Man in the Cave. And the point he makes is that whoever this caveman was, he was most certainly a man, because men paint, men draw, men do art. Here's a little quote from him, and I will try to read it correctly. He says, monkeys did not begin pictures, and men finished them. Pithecanthropus did not draw a reindeer badly, and Homo sapiens draw it well. 
The higher animals did not draw better and better portraits. The dog did not paint better in his best period than in his early bad manner as a jackal. <laughs> the wild horse was not an impressionist and the racehorse a post-impressionist. All we can say of this notion of reproducing things in shadow or representative shape is that it exists now nowhere in nature, except in man, and that we cannot even talk about it without treating man as something separate from nature. And as Christians we say, with Chesterton, man's the image of God. When the Bible opens, we've talked about this a lot, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created before. It tells us directly that God is spirit before it uses words like omnipotent or omnipresent or transcendent. It starts with God as a working artist creating a three-dimensional, four-dimensional, if you will, world of color and shape and texture and complexity uh, marked by wisdom and imagination that we can't even begin to comprehend. And we're made in the image of this creator. So we should create. In fact, we inevitably will create. And it's, it's important for Christians, particularly now at the beginning of the 21st century, to begin to recapture some of this. We are people who should be concerned with the beautiful, the complex, the representative, the taking the big thing and presenting it in such a way that it makes it a huge emotional splash. We, we should be able to tell stories and write poems and write plays. And sometimes we don't. Where for one reason or another, that doesn't seem spiritual enough <laughs> to us. When in fact, it's the first thing God does. We need to read Genesis 1 a whole lot more than we do. And not read it just for theology in the narrow sense, but to just visualize those first six days when God brought everything out of nothing. And it was beautiful and it was wild. And the earliest records we have of man is as a creator, sub-creator, imitating the, the divine creator and making things, drawing things, painting things with imagination and with humor. <laughs> and of course, there's, there's another one of our uh, rabbit trails, humor. God made the platypus. You know, God. <laughs> and the kangaroo. <laughs> the kangaroo, yeah. God, God made all kinds. Of, he made cute little puppies and kittens and God made all kinds of, of incredible, wonderful things. And we should not be surprised that when we find any place we find man, we find man doing that. Uh, my my kids picked up a um, a hobo mug. We live in a community, a section of community where there are a great many transients and street people and such, homeless people, if you will. But in an earlier generation, hobos were a particular sort of person who had a particular sort of code, and they left behind them messages for others who would follow them. It was a very complex interesting system of communication, things that said, in effect, nice lady with cat will give you food for work. <laughs> These people did not live in houses. They lived out in the open under the, the night sky, and yet they themselves were creative with symbols. And they had a community. And they formed community, yeah. And it had its rules. This should begin to sound a little bit familiar. And speaking of the street community here where we live, we have overpasses and a lot of these people go there at night. If we had caves, they would go live in the caves because either because they choose to or because of circumstances beyond their control, they're out there and they need a place to keep warm. Things that have walls and roofs are great places when it's really, really cold. And this has been mankind's history. When mm -hmm. the comforts of civilization fall away, for whatever reason, people run from the cities and they go into the country and they live in forest or under trees or in caves. And so we come back to a thing I mentioned earlier. The Bible does talk about cavemen. My daughters at supper time, I think it was Haley, pointed out that when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, Lot took his daughters and lived in a cave for a good while. And then my wife pointed out David, when he was running from Saul, back in a cave. Mm -hmm. The uh, writer of Hebrews, when he's describing uh, the persecuted prophets and saints of the Old Covenant, 
says that many of them, they, they wandered in the wilderness in sheepskins and they lived in caves on occasion. But in the book of Job, there's actually a rather lengthy description, and I will read it here, and this is the King James or authorized version. Job is complaining about how some of the young men in his area are treating him. He says, but now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me in whom old age was perished? For want and famine they were solitary, fleeing into the wilderness in former time, desolate and waste, who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their food, their meat. They were driven forth from among men, they cried after them as after a thief, to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in caves of the earth, and in the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed, under the nettles they were gathered together. They were the children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth, and now I am their song and their byword. Caves of the earth. He says that in former time, the fathers of these young people, they fled for want and famine. Well, that could be famine caused by rotten um, government economic policies, which is often how famine comes. Uh, it could conceivably be from extended drought. That's rarely the case, but it can be. Or most obviously, war. Mm -hmm. There were cities. They were devastated. People fled. They fled out into the wilderness. They ate what they could find. They lived where they could live. And rather than try, in this case, to form some kind of collective society, they let themselves degenerate until their speech, he describes as braying. That is, their speech was becoming unintelligible. Meanwhile, cities were still out there. Cities were still going on. We can compare this to, say, Australia, where we have Sydney with its opera house. And in the outback, we have Aborigines living as they did hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And again, here in California, in the midst of wealth, unfathomable wealth, richest state in America, the richest nation in the world, we have people who stand on street corners and beg all day and then go and live under overpasses at night. There's nothing odd about cave people, except uh, if we don't want to deal with the reality of of sin and the fall and the consequences of it. So yes, the Bible knows about cave people. It has no problem with them. Mm -hmm. And if we look under those overpasses, we see some pretty amazing art as well. Yeah, often we do because these, these people don't stop being human and they mm -hmm. take their skills with them. And there have been cities where the gangs and uh, juvenile delinquents have spray painted their art all over the place and the cities finally gave up and said, look, we'll give you walls to work on. <laughs> yeah. And they produce some incredible, wonderful things. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to have a college education to be an incredible artist who can show us things that the rest of us have missed because we don't see it your way and you have something to say to us. So again, we're back to this idea of man as the image of God, which is what Genesis tells us he is. And, and we, we need to talk a little bit more about that eventually. Um, but for now, at the very least, when, when, when Adam and Eve were told, you're the image of God, what they knew was what God would have told them about the last six days. Here's how, I mean, they weren't there. God had to tell them sooner or later, look, this is what I've done. And, and when he gets to the point, and so I created you in my image. Oh, and they look at each other and say, so that means we're like God. He made this beautiful, wonderful world. I guess we, we're supposed to be creative like him and make things and think things through and communicate and, and share our labors. And so it goes. That's what they would have understood long before they would have talked about, well, that means that we both have souls and we'll live eternally. <laughs> that was kind of implied, but that wasn't the obvious thing up front. They wouldn't have uh, fallen back and, be, and fallen into contemplation of spiritual realities. They would have picked up some clay and started molding or picked up a sharp rock and some wood and started whittling. They would have found some natural occurring chalk or or some kind of uh, plant pollen and began smearing it around to make colors and images and, and representations. 
because that would be the obvious thing to do for anybody who's not a pietistic, rationalistic <laughs> Christian in the Protestant tradition. Um, it's, it's a sad thing that we have lost so much while we've emphasized abstractions or spirituality in, a, in an almost negative sense of nothing having to do with this world, thank you. But somewhere in the depths of my soul, I find God. And that's not at all what the Bible is telling us. And I believe one of the next things we're going to talk about is the Dominion Mandate and the New Jerusalem, God's vision for this world, and for what he, what man was supposed to do and failed most horribly. Yeah. Well, we will end it there for the night. Um, and we'll pick this up next week. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Greg, for this conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Yeah, thank you, David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks again to Maggie Smith, who did the art for this podcast. And thank you to you, our listeners. We really appreciate you. And we would love to hear from you if you want to send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Yeah. See you next time.